If you want to go to Petty Fort, they told me, go to Bain Harbor on the Buren Peninsula and see Billy Sr. He'll take you there. And sure enough, he did. On a dark and dismal day in June, we steamed out of Bain Harbor and made our way along the west coast of Placentia Bay. It's not the first time Billy Sr. has been in these waters. In fact, he's a bit of a legend on this shore, and everyone around here knows his vessel, the Eighty and Sarah. I'd never been in these waters before, never seen Petty Fort or Oderon or St. Joseph's, or the many other places that I'd heard of so many times. I knew, of course, that many were now deserted. Some had died naturally. Others expired prematurely through centralization. It's scarcely a soft and easy shore, especially out around Cape Roger Head, where the wind funnels in on the rugged cliffs. Bill pointed out the different places to me. put names on the headlands and the coves. He showed me where the people used to live. It's a long, lonely, empty coast these days. Not like years ago when every cove had its liviers and when all men fished. Billy Sr. was a fisherman himself here for a long while, and a good one too, they tell me. He once had a trap berth near here. It's not the first time he's entered Petty Fort. Petty Fort, it's survived. The new homes of those who've come back. The old homes of those who've stayed. It's a long, deep, sheltered harbor. Men have fished here for a long, long time, since the days when the French controlled this bay, I suppose. There are no roads, no cars in Petty Fort. It's two hours by boat to the nearest highway. This is one of the few really isolated communities left on the island, where the coastal boat doesn't even come here anymore. It was replaced, after much fuss, by a smaller ferry. Petty Fort. An artist would have a great time here, and so would a poet. But words and pictures are not quite enough, not in a place like Petty Fort. Men came here to fish, and fish they must if they are to survive. Some of the boats were in. Some were still out on the fishing grounds. We waited. And the gulls waited too. Eugene Jones, fisherman. Oh, like many others of his generation, he's worked away from home. But Petty Fort kept drawing him back, and now he's here to stay. A wife, a home, a family, and a love of the water. Who could ask for anything more? Well, he could ask for a few more lobsters, I suppose. They're scarce this morning. But that's to be expected at this time of year. Many fishermen have their pots out of the water already. It's that in-between time. The lobsters are practically gone, and the codfish have not yet struck in. The fishermen blame the capelin. They're late arriving again. But such is life for a fisherman. He learns to be patient. I was curious about Petty Fort. How has it survived while other places have died? I learned later from Eugene that Petty Fort nearly died too. 
it was almost gone, you know. We got down to 17 households there in 68 sometime or so, somewhere thereabouts. And a few years went by, it didn't look very good. No young people were around there, nobody stayed. And everybody's place was getting a bit shabby. Nobody bothered to fix anything because they figured next year we'll be gone too. But right now it's on up again and we're doing pretty good. It's back to 30 households, or 31 right now all year. And in summer months, there's, there's a few summer families comes back to spend the summer. I hear there are quite a few, uh, there's going to be quite a few babies born here this year. Yes, uh, it's supposed to be eight when they all turns up. Well, that's a good sign for the future of Petty Forest. Yes, it's, like, it's going up and we hope it keeps going up. If it keeps going, we'll be well ahead in the next ten years. Petty Fort. Morning. A thick mist hangs on the harbor, the bay. Good fishing weather. Did I say mist? It was a fog of the Placentia Bay variety, the thickest kind. We went out anyway to see what we could see. Luckily, it soon began to lift, and we could follow the coast and spot the boats out fishing. We cruised around Marticut Island, then on down to Great Paradise and Little Paradise, and the wicked line of rocks that made me glad the fog had lifted. Quite a few of the small boats were out jigging, and they were doing pretty good, as Jean had told me. Yeah, well, right now, up until the fish get closer with the cable, you know, it's good for digging. About 15 of May around here, you can go out and get a pair of fish with the digger just about any time. But after the capelin get in and the fish get blotted, well, it's game over for the digger then. So you figure this is about the end of it for the jigger, and there's quite a few out there today on jigger, but this might be the tail end of that season. Yeah, well, it could go for another week or so, yet off on the ground where there's not much capelin, well, it may go on for two weeks or when the capelins start to go off from the shore, then... How are you doing with us, sir? You got a good many? Yeah, it's got a one here. We got 400 pounds. Boy. It seemed to us like there was a fair, a fair amount of fish for a jigger. There was. This was a good day. Everybody brought in a nice few fish today. I think they must have got close to 30,000 pounds down there. So what would a small boat now get in a good day with the jigger? Well, if you're talking about one fella, he could get 1,000 or 1,200 pounds, or maybe a little better than that, you know. So there's a good day's pay out in boat, no matter which way you fish right now. Oh, God, yes. If you can get a half-decent day now and stay out all day, you'll have a good dollar in the evening when you get back. We went on. I hoped we'd meet Eugene and his brothers so we could watch them haul one of their traps. We searched about. There's a lot of fishing grounds over here, lots of room for the small boats. Once, when Paradise and the other places were alive and well, these grounds must have been crowded. Not so now, there's lots of room. We found the Jones boys on their way to their second trap, and we followed them. 
out around the island they call Martigot, past the lighthouse, and on into the back cove. Well, we got one there on Bonne Voight. We had that down there since uh, early May. And we got one out to Back Cove, Mardicut, where you were today. Were you surprised this morning at Mardicut to see all those fish? Oh, yeah. We did better in the other trap down Bonne Voight, where we get the fish pretty well all the time. But uh, we did better than expected out there, because there wasn't any sign of capelin out there today, anyway. Notice now you've got uh, a big crew with you there. Are you all related? Five us, five brothers, yeah. This is a good way to have it? Well, I suppose we've been together this last seven or eight years now. Four of us have been together a long while, and then the other brother came home the last three years and went with us. So we've been doing all right. You share everything together, or do you, do you have your own fisheries too? You just get together for the trap fishing? Uh, trap season, yeah. Five us together for trap season, and then we split off. Three go together on the gillnet fishery or draw, whatever, and I go on my own boat. The other brother, sometimes they go fishing, and sometimes they go look for a bit of work if we can find some. So what will you do now once the trap fishery is over? Well, I'll go back in my own smaller boat then, back on the trawl again. Trawl and jigger mostly. Now, it's mostly pollock you, you, you get down to Maricot now, isn't it? Yeah, we got uh, about 3,000 pounds of pollock there today. Is this to be expected or, or not? Well, uh, we were getting some pollock all along. We sold uh, 36,000 pounds before today, and we must have dumped well, 40,000 pounds or more for sure, before they started buying them down there. Tell me about the pollock, what kind of a fish is it? Oh, it looks much like a trout now when it's small, you know. It's only about 17 or 18 inches right now. Last year they were 13 or 14. It has to be 16 inches to be big enough to sell, but seems like they're growing pretty fast. It's a silvery, dark fish, isn't it? On the outside, yeah, it's pretty much the same color as a trout has a different scaling, but there's blue on the back and silvery bottom. Well, we get uh, 10 cents a pound, but that's all right now, you know. Awful lot better than dumping them. The, the, how long a day you punch in now this time of year with the trap fishery? Well, there's no sweat to use up at least 18 hours, you know, if you're talking about all day. You leave home, well, around 4.30. And then if you're going to fish all day, get all your traps out and go back to the second hall in the evening, you're going to be at it till dark, 8 or 9 o'clock, or some nights a bit later. So there's not much slack time at this time of year down Petty Four. No, none at all. None at all if you're going to keep going and you're in a half decent dollar. Most of the Petty Fort boats are small. There didn't seem to be the desire to go for the bigger, more expensive longliners that fishermen in many places seem to want. I asked Jean about this. Boy, I tell you, if you get one of those big long liners, you're not going to have too many dollars for yourself because it's all going to go out in expenses. With the small boat, if you go out and get a kentle or two of fish, you know, when you come in, well, you own about four fifths of the kentle. But with the small, with the large boat, you're not going to own very much when you come in, I tell you. Now, you, you fish uh, for just about everything, don't you? Well, uh, got a license for a lobster and cod and, well, other ground fish, you know. But it's not very easy for the young young fellow coming out of school, so he can't get any license. That's the big problem with the fishery now. He gotta go on. There's no license for him. Unless his father or brother or someone decides to give it up and turn it over to him, that's the only chance he gotta get the license. And that makes it hard for you, you know. Well, is there enough grounds out there, enough fish out there for everybody if the fishery did expand like that? 
Oh yes, there's lots of grounds. When all those communities were full of people and full of fishermen, there was ten times as much fishermen out there as there are out there now. And everybody was getting a living then just the same. Now they say you can fish pretty well all year round on the south coast. I suppose that depends on where you are and the size of boat you've got though. You don't fish all year no, round. No, but you can't do very much fishing here in winter time, I tell you now. You may get out one day of a week or two weeks if you're really watching the weather like, you know. But then when the collecting service is over, the, everything's shut down, the bait unit is closed down and there's no bait there, you know. But you still get a fairly long season out of it though. Oh yeah, it goes on from well, early April up until November, when the weather gets really bad in November and you're forced to stay in this pit thing. So you can make a pretty good living here, certainly as good as you can by working away these days, I suppose. Well, everybody seems to be doing okay. Everybody owns what they got around here and, and everybody seems to have a dollar to spend when they want it, so I guess you couldn't ask for any better. You haven't got many cars here, have you? No, the cars are scarce, but there's, I think, 21 skidoos here in the community. Do you miss uh, cars and roads and being isolated down here a bit? Do you feel that? No, not at all. When you weren't born and didn't live with a road, the road don't mean all that to you. We got our road there. Got a, everybody got their own boat and seems like that's just as good to us. You go where you want to go. There was never anybody died in Petty Port because they couldn't get out. There was always a way out. Not that I know of, anyway. So your highway is still the ocean? Right, yeah. Sometimes it's a bit bumpy, but we get there just the same. Mr. Michael Walsh, 87 years old, the patriarch of Petty Fort. You're apt to see him anywhere. Walking the path around the harbor, painting his house, yes, even tarring his roof. Mr. Mick, loved and respected by all. He's interested in everything and everybody. He's a self-taught man, an avid reader. He's been a fisherman on the Grand Banks. He's been a soldier on the battlefields of France. He's a man with memories. A man who's interested in preserving the stories and memories of the old people and the old places. But especially Little Bonnet, the spot where he was born. Do you ever go out there now? I was out there last year. But it's all grew over now, I tell you. All grew over. All, all my people are buried out here in Big Paris, the cemetery. I keep them all in order. I go through and I know all of it stones. I uh, stand straight and tall. I go, I know that's for yeah. the father and mother. My grandfather and my granddaughter. Yeah. yeah. Straight and tall. He keeps the tombstones straight and tall. A proud gentleman. Mr. Mick knows his roots. He knows how strong and tough the old people had to be to survive. He knows their hardships, their triumphs, their tragedies. He's old enough to remember. And he wants others to know too. That's why he's carefully written down all he knows about his ancestral home. Dear reader, yesterday I paid a visit to Little Bone and my birthplace that is seven miles from here in Placentia Bay. I had not been there for a good many years. The place has grown over quite a bit. There is no one living there now, but it's still the place I love best of all. There's not much left today in Little Bonnet to show that six generations lived there. The soil, the weeds are beginning to cover the traces of the few families who call this place home. And only Mr. Walsh remembers the story of the first settler to come to Little Bonnet, his great-great-grandfather, Patrick Dre. There's a story told of Patrick Dre as a young man home in Ireland, making friends with a young Englishman who was there as a soldier in the army, then occupying Ireland. Those were troublesome times when an Irishman's life wasn't worth five cents. This man's name was Hunt, and they became great friends. 
One night, a man was murdered, and Dre was arrested for the crime. It looked bad for him, and it appeared as if he would be executed. But Hun stepped forward and swore Dre's in his company when the man was killed, and proved what he was saying was true, and Dre got scot free. A few years after that, Hunt followed Dre in Newfoundland. A long time ago, a sea voyage across the ocean to Newfoundland. An Irishman looking for a new life. He made his way to Placentia Bay and found this cove, tiny, isolated, hidden almost. It had a name on the chart even then, Little Bonet, but no one lived there. He built a home. And so, Patrick Dre, the Irishman, became Patrick Dre, Newfoundlander, a new life in a new land. He married a girl from Buren. The children came, and little Bonnet was established. Time passed, memories faded. But not the story of Patrick Dre, the first settler, at least not in the mind of young Michael Walsh. This was an interesting yarn he'd heard as a child about the near execution of his great-great-grandfather. For a long while, he didn't think it was true, till one day when he came in from the Grand Banks. When I was in the fishing school years ago, we called up there to St. Joseph, looking for squid baiting. And I for, we were there early after dinner, and I, I rode ashore to walk, and, the walk, and on the walk was an old man sitting there. And I introduced myself and told him where I was and where I come from. And I was an old man, a big white whisker. And I said, sir, were you ever in Little Bonai? Yes, boy, he said, there are nothing tonight. He said, yes, there. He said, for my grandfather, say, if Pat Ray had been hung home in order to say, <laughs> for sure, oh, that's, that's what he said, but I didn't believe it too much at home when they were talking about it. <laughs> but that's it now. And so, on that wharf in St. Joseph's a long time ago, a young fisherman named Michael Walsh met an old fisherman named Thomas Hunt. And they both knew the old story was true. Today, the descendants of these two settlers live and fish side by side in Placentia Bay. Their lives a little bit richer, perhaps, by the stories and the memories that this man has written down. Mr. Mick, he's still there, wandering about Petty Fort, with a smile on his face, a twinkle in his eye, and a song in his heart for the times and the people he knew. To me, our old place in Little Bona is consecrated ground. Consecrated with the work, sweat, and toil of my ancestors. I hear a quote from the English poet Tennyson. The stately ship sails on to our heaven under the hill, but oh, for the clasp of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. My remembrance of Little Bonai is, and always have been, a remembrance of deep affection for the good gentle people that live there. 